Good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. We're very excited to bring back the Coffee Chat series to UNA members and supporters. My name is Paula Bolan. I'm the president of the UN Association of the National Capital Area, one of the largest and most active chapters of the UN Association of the USA, which mission is to educate about the vital work of the UN and to mobilize support for a strong US-UN partnership. We serve the DMV area through a variety of educational programs and advocacy activities. So if not a member already, please consider joining our movement and get actively involved. There are many different ways you can uh, get involved and bring back to your community your passion uh, for international development, international affairs. And visit our website at unanca.org for more information on upcoming events. Today's timely discussion on climate justice has been organized by our advocacy committee, led by Gayatri Patel, Danielle Dean, and Sarah Bassett. Climate justice emphasizes the ethical and equitable dimensions of addressing climate change. It recognizes that the impacts of climate change are not distributed equally and that vulnerable and marginalized communities often bear the burnt of environmental degradation and climate-related disasters. It encompasses the idea that everyone has the right to a safe and healthy environment, regardless of their socioeconomic status, geographic location, or historical contributions to climate change. The key principles of climate justice include equity, Climate justice seeks to rectify historical and current inequalities by ensuring that the burden of climate impact and the benefits of migration and adaptation efforts are distributed fairly. Participation. Climate justice emphasizes the importance of inclusive decision-making processes. It calls for the active involvement of all shareholders especially those who are most affected by climate change in shaping policies, strategies, and solutions. Climate justice acknowledges the historical responsibility of certain nations and industries that have contributed disproportionately to greenhouse gas emissions. Climate justice frames climate change as a human rights issue it asserts that all individuals have the right to live in a climate safe environment, free from the adverse impacts of climate change, and that these rights should be protected and respected in climate policies and actions. Recognizing that climate change is a global challenge that requires collective action, climate justice promotes solidarity among nations and communities. It calls for cooperation in addressing climate issues and supports efforts to assist vulnerable nations and communities in adapting to climate impacts. Climate justice acknowledges the need for a fair and equitable transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. It advocates for policies that protect the livelihoods of workers in industries affected by the shift and ensure that the benefits of a green economy are shared inclusively. So climate justice is not just an environmental issue, but also a social, economic, and ethical imperative. It calls for a holistic approach that considers the interconnectedness of environmental sustainability, social justice and human rights. By creating on fairness and inclusivity, climate justice aims to create a sustainable and resilient future for all, particularly those most vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Addressing climate change and achieving climate justice requires a holistic and collaborative effort that leaves no one behind. It involves reshaping policies, promoting inclusivity, and prioritizing the needs of the most vulnerable communities. It is now my pleasure to pass it on to the chair of our advocacy committee, 
Gayatri Patel, who will introduce our speakers and moderate today's discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Paula. I want to extend a welcome to our audience and a thank you and a welcome to our, our two expert panelists um, for, for joining us today and for really diving into this really important discussion um, that Paula framed so, so beautifully just now. Um, just by way of introduction, we have two experts who throughout their careers have spent uh, time and, and built their expertise on climate change and climate action at the global, national, and local level. Um, Mr. Tim Latimer is the administrator of the Office of Community Sustainability from the Howard County government, Howard County, Maryland, and is the former acting director of the Office of Global Climate Change at the U.S. Department of State. He has more than 30 years of experience um, and his time in the U.S. Department of State as a foreign officer included being part of a team that concluded the landmark Paris Agreement on climate change in 2015, as well as multiple overseas postings and assignments, uh, including in the Department of State's Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science. Prior to that, he worked as an environmental planner and project manager in Southern California um, and has been in his new role at, at the local level in Howard County since June 2023. So welcome, Tim. And Dr. Aubrey Paris is the Senior Policy Advisor for Gender, Climate Change, and Innovation in the Department of State's Office of Global Women's Issues. She leads foreign policy and public diplomacy efforts related to the nexus of gender equality and climate change. Um, previously, she was a science, technology, and innovation policy advisor for the Office of the Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary, and was the recipient of the IEEE USA Engineering and Diplomacy Fellowship. Um, she also worked to amplify the impact of women and girl innovators in developing translatable solutions to climate related challenges. So clearly we have two experts on, on issues related to climate change, public policy at multiple levels and welcome Aubrey and Tim to, to our discussion. Um, we wanted to start off uh, and, and by the way, before we get started, just one quick note for housekeeping. For those of you in the audience, we, we do want to have some time for interactive discussion with our, our panelists. And so if you have a question that comes up during the conversation, please put it into the Q&A function that, that's, that should be at the bottom of your screen. And we will, uh, we will moderate that towards the end of this conversation. But starting first, wanted to just pose a, a question to Tim, if we, if we can start with you. Um, you. You were part of the US team that negotiated the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that moment was so important? And since then, since 2015, what do you see as the key areas of progress um, and maybe even some of the key gaps that we're seeing in terms of global efforts on climate change? Sure. Um, well, thank you, Gayatri and uh, Paula. Uh, really delighted to be with you and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to, to chat with, uh, with you and the uh, members of the UNA NCA region. Um, so I would say, first of all, let's recall the context that what we are talking about is history's uh, most complex, far-reaching international negotiation. It just happens to be on an existential threat, right, that affects human beings, the environment, our economies, uh, national security. And it's a process that includes nearly all countries, uh, representing a wide spectrum of national interests. So that ranges from oil producing countries to countries that are among the least developed and often the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And we have to work to resolve sometimes very difficult, intense differences uh, to achieve outcomes by consensus. So we're talking about nearly 200 countries uh, negotiating. So it's, it's, it's no wonder that this has been a a uh, very slow and difficult process now for decades. Um, the reason why I think the Paris Agreement was a landmark was that it was really a historic 
and enduring agreement that sets the world on a course for achieving a low carbon future. Um, there were several firsts that we saw with Paris. And again, this is back in November of 2015. Um, it was the first time that we've had an ambitious and uh, arguably durable international climate regime. And it sent a powerful signal around the world about the intention of countries to work together and to commit themselves to taking real action on climate change. It was also the first time we had an agreement that really applied to all countries. Prior to Paris, for example, the Kyoto Protocol, really the provisions of that applied to developed countries. Lots of reasons for that, but that was um, how it was structured. Um, so with Paris, we have um, an agreement that is applicable to all. And so it moved us kind of beyond those distinctions that were made in the um, Kyoto Protocol between developed and developing countries. And it was an agreement that was designed to promote uh, increasingly ambitious action over time, uh, built on what, we're what we call nationally determined contributions or NDCs. Um, and going into Paris, uh, 188 countries put their commitments, as, as it were, these NDCs forward, um, uh, articulating their own uh, long-term goals and mechanisms. Um, it was also, I think, the first time that we've had a collective goal uh, to keep temperature rise below two degrees Celsius uh, and to make efforts to limit the, the increase in the overall global temperature uh, to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And uh, that's really in order to, to reduce the, the risks and the impacts of, of climate change. We're already at close to 1.2 degrees Celsius in terms of the global uh, warming that we have seen since the dawn of the industrial era. So we're getting perilously close to that 1.5 degree um, mark. Um, so the other thing is I think uh, Paris helped to uh, give us a platform for uh, the parties to the agreement to you know, reduce their uh, emissions and uh, to do so as soon as possible and to achieve a balance of emissions and uh, removals of carbon from the atmosphere, i.e. carbon neutrality or net zero as some call it, uh, by the second half of this century. And that the countries also agreed to come back to the table regularly to take stock of our progress and to ratchet up ambition over time. We just had that first uh, five-year period of uh, global stock take that occurred in Dubai last fall. And that based on what we were learning, countries are expected to ratchet up their uh, ambition. Um, the other thing is that the uh, agreement was designed to build trust and to incentivize ambitious action. So this includes a binding transparency uh, requirement for both developed and developing countries to report on their progress toward the goals that they've articulated for themselves. And then uh, the other thing that we saw at Paris was the formation of a new grouping. It was called the Climate Vulnerable Forum led by small island developing states. Um, and that really helped in elevating the emphasis that we saw with Paris on adaptation. So in years prior, adaptation, we we paid some attention to it, but most of the attention was focused on reducing emissions through mitigation. Uh, but with Paris, we saw adaptation come much more to the fore because it's recognized that we just have to deal with the impacts that we're already seeing uh, on climate. And then uh, the other thing I would just say is that the Paris Agreement effectively sent a strong market signal to businesses uh, around the world, showing that the countries were agreed, we are going to be moving forward into a clean energy future and that we are going to be leaving behind fossil fuels um, and that there's really no going back on that. So um, it really, I think, also created a, an environment where we had not only nations coming together, but a lot of cities and states and subnational actors and the private sector, uh, they played an active role at Paris. And I think that gave added focus and attention to the importance of actions taken by the private sector and subnational players, mayors, city councils, and so on. Uh, and then finally, I would say that the Paris Agreement was really a, sh a huge shift in the degree of ambition 
that the world was showing collectively in trying to tackle this crisis. I mean, the Kyoto Protocol had aimed for developed countries to cut their emissions by only about 5.2% relative to their 1990 levels of greenhouse gas emissions. So basically setting a target to reduce the emissions so that we could achieve a, or, or limit warming to no more than 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, uh, that's a lot more ambitious because now we're talking about reducing our emissions uh, by half effectively by 2030 and then achieving net zero by mid-century. So that was a big change also that we saw with Paris. So um, now you also asked about areas of progress that we've made since the time of that agreement. And I think at the outset- yeah, I was just about to move. To yeah. Head us in that direction. What? What? How's it going? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds well, like it was a, a landmark agreement. It was a landmark agreement, and we have to recognize that we are still um, at the highest levels of uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere than we've seen ever in human history, and that 2023 was the hottest year that we've seen in human history, perhaps the hottest year we've seen in over a hundred thousand years. And that the, the temperatures that we saw uh, globally uh, this past year were off the charts, both on land and in the water. And that the 10 hottest years that we have in recorded history all occurred in the last decade. If that's not a trend, I don't know what is. So while we have this agreement in place, we still have a long way to go to realize the results in a way that will sort of take us off that path toward uh, a much more turbulent and uh, difficult future. So I really do think that we we have to have a sense of urgency right now and recognize that we are in the decisive decade for taking action on climate. And the scientific community had come out with a report in 2018 saying that we really had to cut emissions by half by 2030, or it's just going to be uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve that net zero future that we need by, by mid-century. And that means this is the decade where we have to make real serious inroads on that. And I, I would argue that this is a time of both great concern about the lack of progress we've made, and uh, I have also been never been more optimistic because what we are also seeing is a real sea change in the degree of investments that are being made in clean energy. And we're seeing really exponential growth happening now with the uptake of uh, clean energy sources like wind and solar. Uh, people are now buying EVs in much bigger numbers, and that is growing dramatically as well, especially here in the United States, but also in, in many other parts of the world. In China, for example, EVs are also taking off. Um, so those are all encouraging signs, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, so uh, I, I would just say that while we have um, local governments, state governments, private sector, and others stepping up their commitments, we also need to pair those commitments with actual investments and real meaningful action on the ground. So to your question about gaps, what gaps we have, I would say one, we still have a problem with the weak political will. And part of that is when you talk about asking elected leaders who live in relatively short election cycles to take hard decisions and make hard trade-offs for which the benefits may not be seen for many, many years, it's really difficult for them to make those decisions because they can suffer the blame for maybe the initial upfront costs that are associated with those decisions. And they get very little, if any, credit for the benefits that might be perceived in later years. Um, the other gap that I think we have is on money. Quite clearly, um, developed nations that we failed to honor the, the commitments that we undertook as far back as 2009. We had promised to mobilize $100 billion per year to help the least developed countries transition away from fossil fuels to a clean energy future and to cope with the impacts of climate. And you know, a decade and a half later, we have not yet really fulfilled that promise. So that also affects the other gap area that I would point to, which is trust. Trust is the coin of the realm when it comes to diplomacy and business, right? So when we have a lack of follow through, or in some cases, reversals or rollbacks, as we saw, you know, when the US negotiated uh, and agreed to the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, several years later, uh, succeeding administration came in and said, we're not gonna put that deal forward for ratification. 
that really undermined trust in the United States around the world. Then fast forward to 2015, we had the Paris Agreement. And 18 months after the Paris Agreement, basically, we had a new administration come in and say, we're not going to stay a part of the Paris deal. We're going to bail out of that, right? So again, that was a huge setback for uh, international trust in the United States. And so we're not the only country that has walked back from uh, some of our commitments, but uh, we're certainly the most prominent one to have done so. And so I think finally, in the way of gaps, uh, we have an ambition gap, right? That we, if we, if we achieve all the pledges that we made coming out of Paris and since, we still haven't gotten ourselves to the level where we could confidently say we are going to be achieving that two degree increase or even a 1.5 degree uh, Celsius increase in global temperatures. So I think that's where we really need to be stepping up that ambition. So those are the gap areas that I would point to. Thank you so much, Tim. That was a really helpful background on some of the the historical frameworks and, and where we've progressed since then. Even though 2015 wasn't that long ago, it, it has been a, a fairly long period for the the opportunity to make investments and, and commitments and really to follow through on on action. Um, if we could turn to Aubrey, Aubrey, a lot of your work at the State Department focuses largely on ways in which climate change impacts women and girls. And you know, it, there you know, building on on what Tim was saying, there there is this um gap in trust and, and part of this is the the trust related to how climate action or, or climate commitment are really inclusive of those who are uh, uniquely impacted by climate change or disproportionately impacted by climate change could you talk a little bit about why is it critical to highlight women and girls in particular and what do you see as the most concerning impact that they experience as a re result of climate change. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me and for hosting this important conversation. I'm particularly grateful for this question because this is a topic that is so new to many, um, but unfortunately not new to the millions of women and girls around the world who do suffer disproportionate impacts of the effects of climate change. Um, I want to start this off by saying that women and girls represent just sort of one demographic of, of groups that are experiencing disproportionate, distinct, or unique impacts of climate change. Uh, but I'm going to focus my, my remarks there today based on the work that I do. Um, it, it turns out that this nexus of gender equality and the climate crisis is actually quite broad, and it comprises both a significant number of challenges and um, a number of opportunities that we really shouldn't scoff at and, and should use as motivation in this space. And when I think of the gender climate nexus, as I like to call it, I, I kind of break it down into three buckets or categories of how these impacts and opportunities can be experienced. The first is really related to natural resource availability and more likely natural resource scarcity that may occur with increasing frequency as a result of climate stressors. So we're talking impacts on water availability, food availability, and the the ability to grow food effectively and in adequate nutritional uh, value. Um, we're talking other natural resources as well, like firewood and, and energy resources. It turns out that in many parts of the world, women and girls have distinct roles and responsibilities related to natural resource management, often in informal capacities. What this means is they're going out every day collecting water for their families or their communities. They're growing food for their families. Um, they're growing food for livelihood purposes. They're collecting the firewood, you name it. And so when, that, when climate change affects the availability of these resources, women and girls experience that challenge differently. 
one of the outcomes or downstream impacts of natural resource scarcity is also this potential combination of forced displacement, migration, uh, conflict, all of which have gendered dimensions. And despite women's and girls' roles in, again, informally managing these resources that can result in all of these greater community challenges down the line, we unfortunately see that in most cases, women do not have a seat at the decision-making table related to these resources, where their insights would be incredibly valuable. So that's kind of category number one. Category number two is a bit of a downstream domino effect, chain reaction, however you want to think of it, of the first bucket. What happens when the resource availability dwindles? Uh, what happens when women and girls need to travel maybe no longer 30 minutes to collect water every day? Maybe now it's six hours every day. What are the downstream impacts? Well, number one, we see markedly increased rates of girls having to leave school, uh, losing educational opportunities, women leaving jobs, and sometimes the only livelihood opportunities that they have to promote their own economic security or their economic independence. But we also see, this is a, a very troubling um, impact that there's actually a ton of data to support, the fact that these sorts of challenges lead to markedly increased rates of gender-based violence, or GBV. This occurs on collection routes, so when women have to travel to farther or unfamiliar destinations to collect natural resources. It happens uh, in the home following resource scarcity when families are facing pressure, financial pressure especially. It happens on migration routes following natural disasters and in temporary shelters put in place following natural disasters. And a lot of people look at these challenges and say, oh, this is a global South problem. Well, yes, this is a problem in the global South, but guess what? It happens right here in the United States as well. You only need to look back to Hurricane Katrina to see a lot of data and incidents of gender-based violence rates increasing in the temporary shelters put in place right here in the United States. So this is a ubiquitous challenge, but there's more. Right, We see rates of child early and forced marriages increase. We see female genital mutilation and cutting increase, all related to this natural resource scarcity as families are trying to cope uh, with financial pressures. I could go on. There are so many more challenges and impacts, health impacts, you name it. But I want to end my, my first set of remarks here on a little bit more positive of a note. And this is the third bucket related to opportunities, specifically opportunities related to economic participation and innovation. This is really recognizing that as innumerable sectors are undergoing transitions to more sustainable practices, as the green and blue economies develop, Opportunities are existing here for increased women's economic participation, and we need to make sure that women and girls have the training, the education, the mentorship, the finance, the resources that they need to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. Sometimes people look at me a little funny here and they're like, why wouldn't women and girls have those opportunities? And we know that there are numerous cultural um cultural or systemic challenges or barriers preventing that assurance. So we need to be proactive, um, a kind of across the board in this space. I would say that this big picture of the nexus of gender equality and climate change really demands parallel efforts that simultaneously address disproportionate impacts of the effects of climate change on women and girls, as well as empowering women and girls as leaders of climate action and climate decision making. Um, and I'll end by saying this is really both a moral and a strategic imperative. It's a moral imperative because it's the right thing to do, right, in our efforts to promote, advance, and ultimately achieve gender equality. But strategically, number one, if you're trying to address something as urgent as a climate crisis, it is really not strategic to leave out half of your population. 
especially when that half of the population has distinct roles and relationships within their environment and their community that often makes them an early warning system of when climate impacts are happening. But also they have these family relationships and community relationships that enable them to generate solutions that will actually be acceptable by communities. So it requires women's engagement and leadership in all sectors and at all levels. Thank you so much, Aubrey. I mean, we I, I could talk with you about gendered impacts of, uh, of climate change for, for hours, but you provided a really useful kind of background encapsulating some of the, the bigger challenges, including natural resources, gender-based violence, um, and exclusion from, from leadership and decision-making. And uh, well, I'll, I have some follow-up questions for you in, in terms of what the US government is, is doing to, to actually act on these issues. So first, if, if I can turn back to Tim for, for a moment. Tim, you've worked on environmental policy issues at global, national, and local levels throughout your career. And you currently are, are leading efforts at a local level in, in Howard County. In what ways do you see local efforts influencing national and global policy and vice versa? Um, and you know, in, in your experience, what, what are the, the issues or the themes or the dynamics that cross over across these levels? Sure, great. Um, maybe before I dive into that question, I also would maybe just want to add to Dr. Paris's comments um, uh, that, um, you know, a few short years ago, there's an organization called Drawdown that did a, a pretty comprehensive scientific analysis of the best ways to tackle the uh, climate change crisis and reduce the emissions. And one of the top things that they identified that societies should do is to invest more in the education of women and girls as a climate action, because that would help to reduce emissions enormously just by having you know, better educational opportunities for half of our population, as Dr. Paris so aptly put it. Um, on the local question, I would just say, first of all, um, some of you uh, in the United States may remember um, the former Speaker of the House uh, of Representatives, Tip O'Neill from Massachusetts, who was famous for saying that all politics is local. And um, over the last 15 or so years, I've given a number of talks um, where I've focused on that and the notion that all diplomacy is also local. Um, we really cannot achieve international agreements like the Paris deal or other sorts of agreements on environmental challenges if there is weak domestic support for that. And that means there has to be enough support across the communities to be able to empower their national governments to go into these negotiations and achieve results that, that people really do need. Um, there are some governments that actually use international agreements. Um, they take the outcomes at these conferences and bring them back home as a way to boost pressure for changes in national and subnational policies to come back and say, hey, we've agreed to this now. We've got to go and do it. And that resonates with uh, residents in many other countries, maybe less so in the United States, where it's much harder. Right. We have over 50 states and we have over 90,000 local government jurisdictions. And we also are operating in what I would term uh, a heavily polluted media environment that fosters an anti-UN, anti-global kind of attitude in a sizable uh, portion of our population, which makes it then hard for us to come back from overseas conferences and say, hey, well, the UN says we've got to do this, right? Because there are a lot of folks here in the United States that are still very skeptical about, um, you know, a UN imposed global government kind of thing. So that's a dynamic I think we have, uh, particularly here in the United States, that we have to contend with. All that said, states and local jurisdictions can serve as real good laboratories. They're not only laboratories of democracy, but laboratories for ideas on developing our economies based on clean energy and climate smart and climate resilient uh, development principles. Um, for example, here in Howard County, we uh, uh, produced our uh, local climate action plan, uh, the final plan we uh, published last June, 
and it calls for a 60% reduction in our county's greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and for net zero uh, emissions by the year 2045. And we've been trying to take a whole of government approach where we are working across multiple departments that have a stake in this uh, to coordinate our action and to try to uh, do a better job and get out of the sto sort of stove piping that is often endemic to uh, public institutions. Um, but beyond a whole of government approach, we also really need a whole of community approach. And that means we have to be more active in engaging with the community and particularly with um, uh, the, the more vulnerable and marginalized portions of our community that have often been overlooked. So this plan did include a, a real focus on equity as well. Um, the other thing I would just say is that you know, systems change, which is what we're talking about, is really hard stuff. And uh, it means that we have to be intentional about it and we have to be transparent about it. So one of the other things that we did was we recently uh, produced what we call our HOCO Forward Dashboard. HOCO is sort of our, our shorthand for Howard County, but we have a, a dashboard that we've produced where we will be reporting on our progress toward implementing the goals that we set for ourselves on this uh, action plan. And I really do believe that transparency is hugely important. It's a way for the public and the stakeholders to hold us accountable and for us to be able to uh, see how we're doing and communicate how we're doing and to be pretty honest about where we might be falling short. Because I think we can't make hard decisions if we don't really know how we're doing. So uh, the other thing I would add finally on that point is that all of this is really the product of having some degree of political courage. I talked earlier about the lack of political will and the difficulty of getting elected officials in particular to make long-term decisions when they are faced with such short-term imperatives. Um, but when they know that they have a public that is behind them, it's a lot easier for them to take bolder action. And I think we have, at least at, in, in the community that I'm fortunate to be a part of, we have a very active and engaged community. A lot of citizen advocacy groups who come in and you know push very hard for stronger action on climate and sustainability issues. And that I think gives the local elected officials much more incentive to want to lean in and um, push for stronger action. So part of our challenge is how do we change that dynamic or extend that dynamic from local levels to the state level and to national and international levels. And to me, that boils back down to public education, public engagement, and really trying to help vector those energies of different uh, interest groups toward a common uh, objective. But again, that, that requires um, a real intentional and painstaking efforts at times. Thanks, Tim. And I, I want to pick up just and follow up a, a, a thread started by Aubrey's remarks and, and something that you alluded to, which is this idea of emphasis on community engagement and particularly how um, initiatives and efforts on climate action are, are really engaging underserved populations, in, including women and girls, but you know, in, in Howard County or, or in the Maryland context, it, it might be other groups that are uniquely impacted. How has the Howard County plan really accounted for that and built built in this community engagement in a way that's that's really inclusive? Um, and that that builds on you know the the leadership and the ability of these underserved populations to be agents and representatives of change themselves. Yeah. No, I mean part of it begins with um First of all, recognizing that even though Howard County is one of the wealthiest counties in the nation per capita, right, uh, and it's a very well-educated uh, community, we still have pockets of the community that are um, hanging by a thread, right, and that are often on the edge. And much like what we see globally, it is very often the most marginalized folks who are impacted first and worst by a climate disaster and they often have the least to do with contributing to it, right? Because they may not be driving around big uh, vehicles or you know, contributing personally to emissions in a way that uh, wealthier folks uh, often do. So I think part of it is, first of all, recognizing that we have that problem. 
Secondly, um, one of the things that we did in uh, preparing our climate plan was we actually did a, a, a survey of folks in the community. And one of the things that we learned, just as an example, was that um, only about 13% of our population even was aware that the county has a number of locations that they could go to in the event of a climate-related disaster, a, a cooling center, a warming center. Um, so we're recognizing now that we have a big challenge just in the way of communications to reach folks in the community so that they understand like what resources might be available to them. And part of that is then how do we get out of our offices? How do we go and engage with folks where they're at? So uh, when I first joined the local government, I, I went around and met with other department heads uh, because we have a climate sub cabinet composed of every department head to coordinate our action on this climate plan. And then we have like eight different working groups. And um, one of the departments that I went to, for example, was our Department of Community Resources and Services. And for decades, they have built relationships with all kinds of uh, community groups and organizations, neighborhood groups and whatnot that my office and others haven't really been that engaged with. And we have to work with our partners elsewhere in the administration, right, who have those relationships. Because if I just walk into a local community group and say, hey, I'm here from the government, and I'm here to help you, and they have no idea who I am or what my office does, they're gonna be a lot less trusting. But by working with colleagues who are already engaged with um, those parts of the community, um, we can better understand where they're coming from, what needs they might have that we have not really attended to, and then figure out how we're gonna be able to attend to those needs. One of the other just sort of practical things that just kind of came up right in our, in our conversations here was, the need for um, having uh, translation services across multiple languages for our public communications. Because it's all very well and good that, you know, I might go out and give talks and others go out and give talks or what have you, or that we produce materials on social media. But if we're not also reaching uh, folks who don't have English as their first language, right? Um, it is a real challenge then, especially if we're dealing with an emergency situation where folks need to know where they can go to get help if we don't have uh, materials produced in multiple languages. That boils down then to the other limiting factor that we have, which is budget, money, resources, right? Um, we have to figure out how we can do those kinds of things and reprioritize to the extent we can to make sure we have the resources to be able to meet those needs. That's a dynamic that we face at a local level. It's also a dynamic I think we have at the state level. Um, our, our state, um, um, the Maryland Department of Environment re recently produced its uh, climate pollution reduction plan, right? And the governor in announcing that plan said that we're gonna have to make uh, a, an investment of about a billion dollars a year um, public agencies, right, uh, to be able to put that plan into effect. That's a lot of money for a small state, um, but it also has implications for local governments about what kinds of investments we need to make to um, promote clean energy, to uh, make our communities more resilient to the impacts of climate change, and so on. So a lot of it has to do with reordering our priorities. Thank you, Tim. Aubrey, turning back to you, I, I would love to hear more about what action the U.S. government is taking. I mean, the, the, the U.S. government has made commitments, um, you know, in, in global discussions around climate change. It's made, it ha it's had domestic commitments through the Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera. What is your office doing and, and what, what really is the plan of action in terms of prioritizing um, addressing some of these unique and disproportionate impacts that you laid out for us earlier. Well, I'm so glad you asked. Um, I'm I'm really proud uh, to say that in August of last year, the State Department launched the first ever United States strategy to respond to the effects of climate change on women. Um, this is a whole of government strategy. Its its development was in 
inclusive of more than 14 federal agencies and White House directorates. Um, and it includes a really robust appendix of actions that are already being undertaken to put its pillars into action. But this is really our um, opportunity to outline our recognition of what this nexus of gender equality and climate change looks like and what policy, programming, outreach, diplomacy, and capacity building efforts we need to undertake across the government to, um, to make sure that we are both addressing disproportionate impacts and empowering uh, women and girls as climate leaders. Um, this strategy is the first ever of its kind in the US government. Um, and it really puts into action uh, one of the first kind of best practices we've witnessed in recent years regarding um, addressing these gendered uh, climate spaces. It's, it's going to sound really simple when I say it, but it has not been simple to see executed in practice. That is breaking silos that have inherently separated policy action related to promoting gender equality and policy action related to the climate crisis. These, these topics have tended to be historically very separate. And number one, we need to understand that these topics are inherently connected. I'm also really proud to say that we've really been working to break these silos within the federal government as well. For the first time ever, the climate crisis is now integrated into every one of the U.S. government's high-level gender policies, including the U.S. National Strategy on Gender Equity and Equality from October of 2021, the U.S. strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally from December of 2022, the first U.S. strategy on global women's economic security from January of 2023, and most recently in October of last year, the new version of the U.S. strategy and national action plan on women, peace, and security. All of these hugely important guiding policy frameworks that guide our gender work now inherently integrate addressing the climate dim dimensions of these topics, which is a huge step forward for, for guiding our USG efforts. I would say as we work to implement all of these, these policies, we know that it is critically important to be engaging with women and girls and marginalized communities at the earliest stages of any project or program we're developing, including and especially in the foreign assistance space as we work on gender and climate change. It's important for us to work with them to identify the barriers that they have been facing to their participation and leadership in climate action and to having their voices heard so we can work with them in meaningful and effective collaborative ways to address those challenges. We also know that it's it's critically important to address the broader topic of intersectionality in this space. Not all women and girls are the same. There are women and girls that are part of indigenous communities, that are in rural versus urban locations, that are part of racial or ethnic minority groups, that are have particular religious affiliation, that are part of the LGBTQI plus community. And all of these factors and other demographic factors can compound to change the ways that women and girls are experiencing these challenges. And that must be integrated into our policies and our programs to make sure that they're actually effective. Because the worst thing is trying to kind of come in as, as Tim mentioned before, come in and say, I'm the government, here's our silver bullet solution. It's just, it's not effective um, and is a waste of everyone's time and resources, frankly. Um, a big tool that we've seen a growing in importance that the U.S. government has been supporting, especially in many locations of the global south, is the development of climate change gender action plans, or CC gaps. These are um, broad community-based policy frameworks that are developed explicitly with uh, full community buy-in that are meant to guide a country or a state's climate action reflective of uh, a gender responsive lens and how to uplift women and girls in a community in climate action spaces. USAID um, has actually funded the development of a number of these um, CC gaps in the global south, which are only growing in importance because 
they tie gender responsive climate action to a given country's nationally determined contributions or those NDCs that Tim mentioned earlier. So making sure, once again, breaking the silos, NDCs traditionally often did not include women and girls specifically called out. We're seeing that pattern change, which is really encouraging. And the last thing that I want to mention right off the bat as an important tool uh, for broad action in this space, but also something that the USG has really doubled down on, is the importance of network building and meaningful network building for women and girls in, who are leading climate action. Um, kind of this idea of communities being laboratories for developing climate solutions that Tim alluded to, we fully agree with and, and believe in that. Um, and so one of the ways we have been emphasizing this is through an initiative that my office has run now for the last two and a half years called the Innovation Station Initiative. And this is a, a project that identifies and amplifies women and girls in the United States and around the world who are developing creative, innovative solutions to community level climate challenges that are developing best practices that can be shared with other communities around the world. I said it before, it's a climate crisis. It requires a sense of urgency. And if we're, if we're keeping our solutions and these best practices out of the hands of the people who need it most, it's just gonna lengthen the amount of time that it takes to address these challenges effectively. So through Innovation Station, we're building a network of women and girls who have these solutions and using our broad networks ourselves as the State Department, these global networks and our U.S. embassies as tools to facilitate the sharing of these best practices, the development of new collaborations facilitated by women and girls who are leading in climate action. So those are just a few examples of a combination of best practices and some initiatives and tools that, that we're implementing right now. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Um, recognizing that we have only about 10 minutes left, I, I want to turn to some of the questions that the audience has, has submitted through the Q&A function. And if I could ask both of you briefly to, to respond to a couple of them. Um, first, we have a question from Brian Heilman. Um, with, within the DMV area, many jurisdictions have passed ambitious climate laws. In DC, the district has enacted the net zero by 2050 uh, law. And I, I know that Maryland also has, has enacted legislation recently. The question is, how can we in UNA help make this new law a reality and see its just application across the DMV? That's one question. And then similarly, or related to that, we have a question from Jill Christensen. What are three actions that each of us as advocates and voters can take to advance this progress, ensuring that we take real action on climate that is inclusive of gender? Um, so if, how about we start with you, Aubrey? If, if first question was on how to make local laws actionable and, and, and to make them, it, turn them into reality. Um, and the second question was, what are three actions advocates and voters can take to sustain progress? Well, I would say that, you know, I'm the, the first question is a bit outside of my scope, but in my personal opinion, based on my own observations um, in terms of enact, effectively enacting these local level or uh, policies, um, I think is is taking a good hard look at what challenges different communities, different groups within a community might face in being able to take part in um, community decision making. For example, we've seen, I'll even analogize this to the Global South. Um, we've seen in the Global South many instances where programs are meant to involve the community. And so there's a big consultation session and it happens um, at a certain time of day when women and girls can't get there because they're picking up the kids from school or they have other elder care or child care responsibilities that prevent them from going to the town meeting or what have you. 
Another great example of something that can very easily be translated to right here in the United States, making sure that consultations, meetings, planning sessions, um, the meetings of different committees and advisory groups that we want to be inclusive of all community voices, making sure that those meetings and, and engagements are happening um, with a lens to all the other responsibilities that different people might have in their lives, making sure that they can access those opportunities. Maybe it means having a, you know, a child care center when you have your town meeting because that will help women be able to come to the table. Um, I think that sort of realistic perspective is, is really important to have and is often overlooked. Um, on the second question, which was just sort of tangible actions that people can take as advocates, as voters, as consumers, um, you know, there's a lot that can be said for knowing where your purchasing power is is kind of falling. There are so many great um, initiatives and platforms now where you can identify women-led small businesses um, or you know other opportunities to support women and marginalized groups uh, through purchasing power. Um, making sure that when you're hosting community discussions, you are in actively inviting women, people of color, others to the table to give them a voice and a visible voice at that. Um, it, it kind of depends on on what direction you want to go as a consumer, as a voter, as a as a elected official, et cetera. But just I think taking conscious, making a conscious effort to um, give yeah, women and girls, that sort of equal voice is, is really important. Thanks, Aubrey. Really, really important reminders about making decision making and, and leadership accessible to, uh, to marginalized communities. Um, Tim, anything you want to briefly add? I, I, we do want to end sure. on time and I, yeah. I do have some follow up actions, but I'm open to you for, for responding to this question. Sure. Well, first of all, yeah, I mean, those are all great observations uh, from Dr. Paris. And I would only add, um, both on the question about what the UNA can do and about what individuals can do, I think what you're doing right now is terrific, which is facilitating these conversations and getting this these issues out into the atmosphere for folks to, to, to chew on and to try to better understand. Um, and then it goes down to, you know, what we can do as individuals. And I'd say there's a couple of things. One is uh, to talk about it because we don't talk about these things enough, to talk about it with our friends, our neighbors, uh, the people that we do business with, you know, to to share our concerns, because I think if businesses and others begin to hear from customers that, hey, you know, we're concerned about, you know, what kind of carbon impact is, are we contributing to here, right? What are we using to, to, to you know, with our dollars? And that goes to uh, what I often like to say is use your voice and use your vote. Um, and what I mean by that is speaking up, uh, in public fora, when there's an opportunity to to bring these issues into the conversation, whether it's a town hall meeting or any other space where it's important for folks to bear these kinds of challenges in mind and to make those connections uh, very clear for folks that, you know, we have a stake in this and the actions that we take as individuals can make a difference. And then finally, on using your vote, it's not just about voting for candidates that are committed to climate justice and climate action but also the votes that you cast with every dollar that you spend, the investments that you make. And this goes back to what I was saying about talking to you know, the businesses that, that you do business with, right? To see what they can be doing to, to do a better job and, and let them know that, you know, you support them, but you also want to see them uh, taking stronger action. So those are just some of the things that we as individuals, I think, can do. Hope that's helpful and um, turn it back over to you, Gayatri. Thank you. Incredibly helpful, Tim, and a really important reminder to keep talking about these issues. And with that in mind, we, we, I, Paula, why don't I turn to you? Um, we want to leave you, the audience, with a few actions that, that you can take, including one event that is actually happening this evening, which is, I'm sorry, let me pull it up. It is the, hmm. Maryland Legislative Briefing on, on Environmental Action, and I just had it up. It's happening today, uh, this evening, and it is, uh, 
I've lost it. Well, I tell you what, let me send it over to Paula (laughs) while I pull it up. Well, in in the interest of time, uh, we will be following up with everyone here, as well as the larger membership, uh, with a a recording of this uh, timely conversation, as well as resources that were mentioned during the conversation and some others that we want to share with you. And we can let them know about this event uh, as well. Um, I don't have the details in front of me. It's not a UNA and CA event, but Tim, go ahead. I can tell you it's at the Graduate Hotel in Annapolis. All right. uh, 6.30, uh, presentations begin at 6 p.m. (laughs) Doors open at 5.30 p.m. this evening. All right. Yeah, Um, and it's the Maryland Environmental Legislative Summit, um, which sounds fantastic. That's happening this evening. And like Tim said, it's from 6 to 7.30. And... um, on February 7th and February 12th, there's the Sierra Club Lobby Night in Annapolis. So we will send around that information for, for everyone to take action. But in the meantime, just wanted to say thank you so much to Dr. Paris and to, to Administrator Tim Latimer. We are so um, you know pleased to have had this conversation with you, to, to have benefited from your expertise. I learned an incredible amount and, and really feel motivated to act. Uh, and, and hope those in the audience did as well. Um, and, and Paula, thank you to you and UNA and CA and your team for, for really bringing this conversation together. Uh, we, we hope that everyone learned a, a, a lot and uh, also similarly feel motivated to act. Thank you. Gayatri, you led this effort. So thank you uh, for bringing it to Frisian and thank you to our speakers. Team has participated in previous events um, and and Jill is our board chair is with us and made that connection. Uh, Aubrey, we work very closely. We stayed on a number of different initiatives. So we look forward to our continuing engagement with you in the space of gender equality. Um, And yes, we we will continue to address uh, climate related issues, climate justice, uh, so stay in touch, everyone, get involved in UNA and CA, there are many different ways that you can do that. As I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of other programs coming up. Uh, This is a network and a platform for you to voice uh, your opinions and to generate action. We actually have a a program that is called Global Goals at Home and brings the the 17 sustainable development goals um, um, to the DMV area. Uh, We have a team that looks at how these goals are being implemented in our local communities in the DMV area and where are the gaps uh, so that's that's another way uh, we will follow up with this very interactive dashboard and you can check when it comes to climate action, that specific goal, um, how how our, our communities are doing and what are the, the most critical needs. But we can all do something at the local level in our own backyard uh, when it comes to um, climate change and being more inclusive of those that have been more affected and not necessarily have a voice uh, when decisions and policies are being um, discussed. 